Welcome to LG Ministry. We're glad you have chosen to watch our program. My name is Coogan Collins, and I'm the minister at the Long Grove Church of Christ. Our hope and desire is that you will open up your Bible and study along with us. Be sure to check out all of our lessons on YouTube. Now let's get to our lesson. Thank you for joining us for part two of Living the Abundant Life. In part one, we talked about how every Christian can have the abundant life through Jesus. Most of our lesson came from John chapter 15, which taught us that in order to live the abundant life, we must be part of that one true vine, which is Jesus, because if we are not, we can never bear fruit that will be acceptable to God. We looked at some fruits that we can bear as Christians. Then we talked about how we must abide in Christ to be able to produce that fruit. Well, in this lesson, I want to examine the question, how do we abide in the vine? Again, Jesus answers this question in John 15, starting at verse 10. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may remain in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do whatever I command you. Did you see the answer? Jesus said, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. And he says, if you keep his commandments, you are my friend. Also, please note 1 John 3 verse 24. Now he who keeps his commandments abides in him, and he in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given us. So if we want to abide in Christ so that we can live the abundant life, then we must obey God's commands. Many today seem to think that the word obedience is a dirty word, and they cringe at the thought that we have a law to keep. But the Bible makes it clear that obedience to God's will is absolutely necessary. For instance, notice what Jesus says about this in Mark 3 in verse 31. Then his brothers and his mother came and standing outside they sent to him, calling him. And a multitude was sitting around him. And they said to him, Look, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. But he answered them saying, Who is my mother or my brothers? And he looked around in a circle at those who sat about him and said, here are my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and mother. Here Jesus makes the point that whoever is obedient and does the will of the Father will be his mother, brother, or sister. Since obeying God's will causes this kinship with Jesus, if we don't obey God's word, then the opposite would be true. We will not have any kinship with Jesus, which stresses the importance of obedience. Jesus came across some people who recognized who he was, but they weren't following his words. So he asked them a question in Luke 6, verse 46. But why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do the things which I say? It's not enough to call Jesus your Lord, because we must be willing to obey the things that Jesus has taught us through the word. Obedience to God's word has been taught throughout the Bible. Therefore, whether you are reading in the Old Testament or the New Testament, you will discover that God has always demanded an obedient faith. Jesus understood this and lived his life by it. Since he is our example, we should follow in his footsteps. For example, in John chapter 4, after Jesus had talked to the Samaritan uh, woman at the well about how we must worship God in spirit and truth, his disciples came to him encouraging him to eat some food. But notice what Jesus says to them. John 4 verse 32. But he said to them, I have food to eat which you do not know. Therefore the disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him anything to eat? 
Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Jesus understood what his priorities were. So he was always ready to put the will of the Father first, even before filling his own belly. I like what Job says about this concept in Job 23, verse 12. I have not departed from the commandments of his lip. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. This should give us an idea of how important it is for us to get into God's word, to live by it, to, to read it, to make it a priority in our lives. Jesus is the greatest example of this and he states with clarity in John 6 and verse 38, For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. I don't know of anyone who would be bold enough to say that Jesus was not obedient to the Father in all avenues of his life. Even when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane and the weight of the world's sins were on his shoulders and he was so stressed that he began to sweat drops like blood from his head. He still said this in Matthew 26, verse 39. Oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. No matter what situation Jesus found himself in, he never ever put his will before the Father's. And that is why the Hebrew writer says this in Hebrews 5, verse 8. Though he was a son, yet... He learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Just as Jesus was obedient to the Father's will, we too must do our best to be obedient to God's commands. Please notice very carefully that Jesus is the author of salvation only to those who obey him. So don't ever let anyone try to convince you that obedience to God's word isn't important because it is. John said in 1 John 2 and verse number 3, Now by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. It should be easy to see that in order to abide in Christ, we must obey the will of the Father in order to live the abundant life. But what should be our motivation for obeying the will of the Father? Well, the way I see it, there's at least three different reasons a person might obey God. Number one, Someone might obey because they are motivated by fear. All they know is that they don't want to face any punishment. It's kind of like a dog that has been beaten in the past and every time you go near it, it cowers in the corner because it's afraid you're going to beat it again. Now God does want us to respect his power and the punishment that will follow if we're disobedient, but he doesn't want us to be motivated into following him out of this type of fear. He doesn't want our tails tucked between our legs. God wants you to choose to follow Him. And He wants you to love Him just as He loves you, as John wrote, 1 John 4, verse 16. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God and God in Him. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. Number two, another way some people are motivated to obey is that they feel like they need to in order to get what they want. For example, a teenager may obey their parents or do little jobs for them, but not because they want to do it, they do it because they feel like they have to in order to get favors or to be able to have their parents do things for them. This describes someone who's going through the motions, but their heart isn't into it because their real motivation is just their own selfish gain. And God doesn't want us to obey Him for this reason. We have an example of this in Scripture that had a fatal ending for a husband and wife. This can be found in Acts chapter 5, right after Barnabas had sold his land and gave all the proceeds to the apostles for the work of the kingdom. Acts 5 verse 1. 
But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession, and he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife also being aware of it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So great fear came up on all those who heard these things. And the young men all rose and wrapped him up, carried him out, and buried him. Now it was about three hours later when his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter answered her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. She said, Yes, for so much. Then Peter said to her, How is it that you have agreed together to test the Spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in and found her dead, and carrying her out, buried her by her husband. So great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things. As I mentioned, right before this event, Barnabas gave his money from his land in the same way. But his motivation was to serve the kingdom. We have no indication from Scripture that he was trying to look good or to find a position of power. However, Ananias and his wife had some kind of ulterior motive that we're not told about. But it certainly is implied that they were trying to look good to the apostles or to other Christians because they lied about how much they sold their land for. Whatever the reason, it certainly seems reasonable to see that this husband and wife were giving only a portion of their funds to try to gain something instead of giving out of love for the kingdom. And it cost them their lives. So this is a dangerous game to play with God. And it will not work out well for you in the end. Number three, some are motivated to serve God because they want to, because of their love for the Father. For example, when children love their parents, they will do things for them and obey them because they respect and love them. This is how God wants us to be motivated. He wants us to obey Him because we love Him. As John 14 verse 23 says, Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. And my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. Again, John says in 1 John 5 and verse number 3, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. It's very important that we realize that love should be our motivation for obeying God's commands. Think about it. If God wanted to make us obey through fear, I guarantee you He could make every single person cower like a dog. But if He did this, He'd be violating our free will. If God wanted to force us to obey Him, He would have made us that way from the beginning. And if He wanted to change His mind about our free will, he had plenty of opportunities and encouragement to do so by the behavior of the children of Israel in the Old Testament. Since God respects our free will, it shows that He loves us and He wants us to choose whether we will love Him back. The only way that we will be successful in remaining committed to obeying the Father's will is if we are motivated by love. Let me give you an example, Hebrews 10 verse 24. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. This passage teaches us that we should not forsake the assembling of the saints. Now those who look at passages like these with the motivation of fear or with the attitude that I have to do uh, something in order to be able to receive this blessing from God, that's not going to be enough because they're going to get to the point where they only do certain things to the point that makes them feel justified in their own conscience. For some, this may be only coming on Sunday morning. To others, it may mean coming once or twice a month. And when we have the wrong motivation, passages like these will seem like such a burden to us. When a Christian is motivated by love and they see a passage like this, they don't look at them as a burden or something that they have to do. 
No, they look at it as an opportunity to love God back by obeying His commands. They will find great joy in assembling with the saints every opportunity they have because they understand that it brings glory and honor to the Lord. They also understand that it is a wonderful time to be edified and to edify others. If you are ever going to learn to live the abundant life, it's imperative that we learn to make love our motivation for obeying God. I want to end this point with the words of Paul in 1 Corinthians 13, verse number 1. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. So surely we can see the importance of love and how we must learn to love God. But how do we love God? Well, the answer to this question should be obvious. We must learn all we can about Him. We have no problems understanding this in our everyday relationships. For example, many of us are married or have been married. Did you just instantly fall in love with your mate when you first met them? Or did it take some time? Well, for most people, it takes time for us to get to know each other. And the more we learn about each other, the more we begin to fall in love. Once our love was developed, we are willing to do just about anything for our mate, whether it be something small or something big. The same thing is true with friendships that you make. You don't just become friends with someone the instant you meet them. No, it takes time to develop that relationship and for you to learn to love that person as a dear friend. Well, the same thing is true when it comes to God. If we ever hope to learn to love Him, we must get to know Him. How do you get to know another person, and how do you effectively grow in that relationship? Well, first of all, I think most of us would agree that we must be willing to spend some time with that person in order to get to know them. I mean, how else are you going to build a bond? Number two, we must effectively communicate to find out what we need to know. If we have poor communication, then we will probably never get to know that person. Of course, this includes listening well. While some of us are really good at talking and just flapping our jaws, the other person, you know, they'll get to know a lot about you and everything that's in, in your life, but whenever you spend so much time doing this, you're not going to learn much about them. So in order for us to learn more about God so that we can develop a love for Him, we must read His Word because this is the only way that we will learn about Him and we must pray, which is our way of talking to Him. God has provided us with everything we need in the Bible to learn to trust Him and to love Him. This is why Paul says this to Timothy. 2 Timothy 3 verse 16, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And Peter tells us in 2 Peter 1 and verse 3, His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us by glory and virtue. So everything we need to know about God so that we can love Him is found within the Bible. Just like in a marriage, when a couple spends more time with each other, they learn to love each other more and more. Well, the same thing is true with God. The longer we are Christians, the more we're going to love Him. But the only way that we will grow in that love is by reading more and more of His Word and by living by that Word. Also, we need to spend more time speaking to the Lord through prayer. As Peter says in 2 Peter 3.18, But grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Paul also understood how important it is for us to continue to study God's Word which is why he commanded Timothy to do this very thing. 2 Timothy 2, verse 15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. 
Simply put, the more we read, the better we will know our God and His will. As simple as this sounds, I believe that reading our Bibles is the foundation of living the abundant life. By reading, we learn to know God. By knowing, we learn to love God. By loving, we learn to obey God. And by obeying, we learn to abide in God. By abiding, we learn to bear fruit for God. By bearing fruit, we experience the abundant life. So if you want to learn how to live the abundant life, you must not neglect the Word of God. Instead, you should make it a part of your everyday life and never forget to pray to God on a daily basis. If you do this, then you will have an abundant life. Again, as Jesus said, John 10, verse 10, I have come that you may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Hope you found this lesson helpful. No matter what lesson I preach, I want you to test what I say or any person says about God's Word by comparing what is being said to the Bible. Don't ever be lazy in this area because it is too important to simply trust in what a man is saying because we are all human and we're capable of being wrong. One thing we know for sure is that God's Word will not lead us astray, so we can always trust in it. As Psalm 146.3 says, Do not put your trust in princes, nor in a son of man, in whom there is no help. Psalm 18, verse 30, As for God, His way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to all who trust in Him. I will always do my best to preach the truth, but I hope if you catch me teaching error that you will contact me so that we can discuss the matter. If you would like to learn more about LG Ministry and the congregation I preach at, feel free to visit our website at lgchurchofchrist.com. On our website, you will find a lot of material that can help you with your spiritual growth. On our main page, you will find an online correspondence course that you can take that will walk you through the basics. On our sermon page, you will find just about every sermon I've preached at my local congregation. You will also find some audio sermons and Bible class materials that you are free to study and use. On our article page, you will find tracts that you can read and print off and articles that have been written for our local paper. Finally, on our video page, you'll find our new video lessons like the one that you're watching now. I know we live in a fast-paced world where it seems like we don't have time to do much of anything. But I want to encourage you to find time out of each day to sit down and to study God's Word. Life is great and there's nothing wrong with being busy. But we must be careful that we don't get to the point where we get so busy that we fail to take time to feed ourselves spiritually from God's Word. We must remember that God is supposed to be our number one priority. If you find my lessons to be helpful, be sure and tell people about our program so that others can hear sound lessons from the Bible. I hope you have a blessed day.